Welcome ladies and gents, Chris Andre here. You can find me at BetBoxing on Twitter, or of course you can subscribe to the channel. Let's talk boxing. We're going to talk about four fights that took place over the course of the weekend. Tim Zhu gets rid of Tony Harrison ahead of a big fight against Jamel Charlo. We'll talk about some of those strengths and weaknesses that he showed, what can really help him in a fight against Charlo, and what could potentially be a stumbling block for him. We'll also talk about how Diego Pacheco really destroyed Jack Cullen in a ferocious performance which showed a lot of composure too. We'll discuss Stan Aziz and his European title success against Thomas Four, And we'll also talk about the big heavyweight fight from Paris between Tony Yoka and Carlos Takam. I wasn't surprised to see Carlos Takam shock, so to speak, Tony Yoka. Before we get into it though, I just want to say that I personally wish all the best to Robbie Davis Jr., a really horrible injury that he seemed to sustain rolling over the ankle backwards, seemed to break. He will be undergoing surgery and we wish him the very best here at Chris Andre Boxing, a speedy recovery. Now let's talk about the fights over the course of the weekend. We'll start off with Tim Zhu and Harrison. You know, a lot of people ask the question of Zhu versus Castaño as a pressure fighter. Who's a better pressure fighter? Jamal Charlo's dealt with Castaño. What's Tim Zhu going to offer? Tim Zhu is actually quite different to Castaño. Castaño will make you rush your work a little bit more. Uh, he'll dip forward. He's not as tall as you. There's a different sort of physical um, imposition that comes as an obstacle from somebody like you. But Castaño also, like I said, will make you rush your work. That wasn't the case last night with Tim Zhu. He was walking in behind this high guard and he was walking in quite slowly at times. And what that was doing was forcing Harrison essentially to take the initiative because Zhu wasn't actually throwing jabs and he wasn't taking big steps in either. They were short steps. He was making sure he was staying close. So the pressure that he was adding to the fight wasn't the sort of pressure where you feel like, oh my word, I can't breathe. This is an asphyxiating type of pressure. It wasn't that sort of thing. It was almost more like a zombie. You know how zombies never stop coming and they keep walking you down, right? Tim the zombies you last night was walking him down. But you feel like, I've got time, I've got time. And you're running away. And then your cardio starts to let you down. And you're thinking, this dude isn't making me work that hard. But my God, I can't get away. It's incessant. It's like he's constantly there. And that's what we started to see. And he coming behind that guard and you saw that Tony Harrison, who's really underrated, man. I really like Harrison. I don't think he's ever gotten the credit he's deserved. I like him as a character as well. I think he's got a wonderful flashing jab and he can control a fight with that jab alone. But he's also got this balance between being cocky and humble that I find really endearing. You know, there's a difference between cockiness and arrogance. Arrogance to me is when you're looking down on other fighters or other people, you put them down. Cockiness is when you're not putting anyone else down, but there's almost like an element of self-love, a twinkle in the eye. Like, you know, you, you put yourself on a pedestal, but you're not actually lowering others. You're just... It's almost like self-love, like you've got a crush on yourself. And maybe it's because I've grown up watching WWE wrestling, the heels of the time, the villainous guys, the bad guys, with the cool, cocky guys. And maybe that's why I've grown up finding it entertaining. But Harrison's just so unintentionally funny. He'll just go from straight savage to humble in the space of seconds. And you're thinking, what just happened there? It's just a hilarious transition. And you saw post-fight, he spoke about how he felt that the timing of Tim's Zhu and his reactions were very, very good. And he was very impressed in how rapidly Zhu was progressing. And you could see that Zhu was looking for those moments, walking you down. Yes, the jab is going to split the guard at times and land. But when you throw your jab, I am going to be landing some big shots of my own. And he's got this wide left hook, which even when it's cupping, there's so much weight behind it. There's a physical imposition there on the opponent that it breaks his construct. And Tim's you was successful at affecting the balance of Harrison at times there as well. The other thing that he'll often do is when he's going to eat a right hand, because Harrison's got a sneaky right hand at times, even though he wasn't really throwing it much. And the reason he wasn't throwing it is because that trigger counter was swift. The reactions were swift. So it was the timing, as Harrison said. So it made him a little bit gun shy at points. But when the right hand would land, he's almost turning. And that turn, as it lands, not only takes something off of the shot, but he's cocking for his own counter. And he'll come back either with that wide hook or he'll come up with that sneaky right uppercut that follows. And then from there, he'll let go of a combination. So you will land one right hand and then he'll come back with twos and threes. And because he's naturally quite a physically strong guy, opponents are feeling these shots, right? He's not a one-punch knockout artist necessarily where he's going to touch you and turn your lights out, but they're heavy thudding shots. Now, one of the areas, though, where I think he struggled a little bit, and it's a bit of an ominous sign when you're talking about someone like Jamel Charlo, is when Harrison was changing the levels, because there wasn't much lateral movement last night, 
But a lot of that was probably because of the fact that Tim's you wasn't over committing with the shots. He wasn't trying to lead him behind that jab and throw these um, flurries of shots consistently as he's chasing, which is enabling Harrison to move away. He's keeping that those feet narrow and making sure he's staying close and because he's marrying that with wide hooks as you try to exit that pocket you could get caught as you're moving out so he was almost keeping Harrison in front of him especially because it was a small ring it didn't take that much of a forward march for Harrison to then be forced back onto the ropes but when Harrison would change the level you saw that at times Tim Zhu wasn't comfortable with that mobile target and you saw it for instance in the second round when he hurt him with that counter right hand that trigger counter right hand Harrison was hurt. And when he went back onto the ropes, Harrison's only real form of defense was to cover up and try and change the level, go up and down. And what did you see? Tim Zhu didn't throw a two-handed assault. He was using the left hand to try and control um, Harrison, to stop him moving and then shoot uppercuts, right hands. And he was missing. He was inaccurate, even then. So even when he's limited his attacks to one shot, the right hand, he was still missing. It wasn't like a two-handed assault where he's getting off balance because he's over-swinging, he's gotten too excited. He didn't like the moving target. And Jamal Charlo is a guy who is very, very agile. I've spoken on this channel many times before about how a very underrated physical attribute is agility. Everybody talks about power and speed and stamina and reflexes. People don't really talk about agility. And Jamel is the sort of guy who will land a shot and then change the level, get low, and then pivot out. And when he's pivoted out, he's leaning way far back. There's a lot of agility there. And if he's able to get low, and as he gets low and he exits, he'll come up with an uppercut to exit. He'll catch you with shots you're not expecting to see coming. These are areas where if he's struggling to find Jamel, who's changing the levels, he could be getting punished for it. But because he's physically strong and he does use that left hand, he's going to have to use that quite a lot to hold charlo in certain areas when he tries to to change the level and really affect his body construct or as he's seeking to exit continue to throw that little shovel left hook to the body that he does which is a heavy-handed shot the other thing is showing a bit more upper body movement on his entry he was far too easy to hit with that jab and by not showing upper body movement what it does also do is it enables you to maintain your construct so that if your opponent exits the pocket, you're already upright and able to chase him rather than come down and then have to come back up to chase him. Now, slipping as you enter will enable you to throw a counter from there. But if a guy is landing a shot and instantly changing the level, if you've, say you've put your weight onto that lead left foot and he's moved off to your own right, he then goes out of range. So there are trade-offs for everything. The other thing, by the way, really quickly, is that when there was a faint jab from uh Harrison before a proper jab came in he was finding a lot of success for it because he noticed that Zhu started to attempt to parry the jab and he would move his hand a little bit too low and so he would read that shot faint draw out the attempted parry and then come with a an up jab and so there are going to be certain things that Carlo will look at and think to himself I'm going to be able to potentially expose some of these things Moving on from that, let's talk about Pacheco and Jack Cullen. You know, I put out a tweet when he fought Luna back in December, and I've been speaking about him now for a couple of years, Diego Pacheco, saying what a talented guy he is. And I was saying how composed he is. And that really applies to this day. And I was saying how I need to do a technical breakdown on this guy, and I've never gotten around to doing it. But give myself salmonella food poisoning. When I'm ready to devour you, I will. And there's a real confidence when it comes to that, because there isn't that panic. It's not a case of I've landed something big. I must capitalize right now. No, 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 I don't need to do that. And he's got a real understanding of distance. His distance control is very good. Even against a very tall guy like Jack Cullen, he would land his own jab and then just slide out the way and the jab would miss. And that brings you a lot of, uh, a lot of success because you're always in a position where the other guy's thinking, I'm landing on air here and there's potential real fire coming at me. So it makes the other guy tentative. That's not to say he's a perfect fighter. The Benavides have done some terrific work with him and, and Eddie Hearn was very, very praising of Benavides um, as a result of that. But when he does throw his right hand at times, he can dip all the way down to the side, which is fine because you're coming off the center line. And at times when Jack Cullen was a little bit too upright and he was coming off the line, that was the real difference between the two. But his back foot can over-rotate sometimes and twist inwards as he throws that right hand. And if somebody moves over to his own right-hand side from that position, it's going to take an extra split second to readjust and turn with him. So there are some areas there. The other potential problem that I found is that if you look in round three, for instance, where Jack Cullen had some success, on three occasions that I can think of off the top of my head, and I wasn't explicitly counting, so there may be more through the course of the fight, 
But you'll notice that there were times when Jack Cullen was coming downstairs with a jab and then coming upstairs with a follow-up right hand and he was landing. And one of the reasons he was landing is because when that initial jab lands to the body, you'll see that Pacheco folds forward. He bends forward, he folds. And that freezes you. You're caught with the shot there and you fold forward. Well, from there, you're not moving anywhere. So you're a sitting duck now. And so if a guy is looking to set up a big power punch against Diego Pacheco, he might look to shock him with a sudden jab to the body, followed by a really loaded up big right hand that could land because he gets stuck in the mud a little bit there. But as I've said on numerous occasions, this is a developing fighter. He's 22 years old. Eddie Holmes saying, let's drop the prospect tag. You can drop the prospect tag in terms of his abilities as a fighter. He's, he's ready for world level. But if you're talking about him conquering super middleweight, there is still some development to be done there, but I am massive on him, man. I'm really high on him. I think he's so talented. Definitely a future world champion. Definitely a guy whose name you will be talking about for many years to come, in my opinion. Diego Pacheco, he looked superb last night. Jack Cullen, really game. A good boxer, man. I like Jack Cullen, but for the second time now, he's been dropped of a body shot and perhaps that's his kryptonite you know and maybe he's struggling to make the weight he's tall at the weight category and that can sometimes make you a little bit supple in the midriff let me know what you think about that let's talk about Dan Aziz listen Aziz is a throwback fighter is he not this is a guy that idolizes Marvin Hagler dresses like him tries to fight like him he is a guy that has gone the hard route the traditional sort of humble route from regional titles, right? The area title, the regional title. And then from there, the English title, then the British title, then the Commonwealth title, now a European title. And that's what he's done, step by step by step. And he remains a very humble guy. He even came out to Earth, Wind and Fire. So he really is a throwback fighter. And his defense is very underrated. He's the sort of guy who'll throw gazelle punches, you know, who'll leap in with that jab as well to close the range. There's this suddenness. Um, behind what it is that he does. You think you're safe and he's on the outside and suddenly he's on your chest and he's going to work. But when he's on the inside, you'll see that he's defensive, you're responsible. He'll duck a lot, he'll change the positioning of his head and he'll throw up hands to block. You saw that when the knockout came, for instance, there was an attempted jab at sort of mid-range and he closed his hands, caught the jab and then threw a trigger counter. And you'll see that even in other areas, he'll throw up shots to deflect shots, to put up an arm. He'll see something coming and he'll start to try and parry it away and then instantly go to work. So whilst he forces you to work, really, you know, applying pressure, he's also a guy that's there to be hit in the sense that Four had some success last night, right? He was landing the uppercut a lot. And maybe he didn't have the power to really trouble Aziz. Maybe a bigger puncher would have. But when you're fighting the fight that Aziz does and you're bringing that heat constantly, you're going to be getting caught with shots. But for a guy like that, he's very good defensively. And I really do want to see him in against some of the top fighters in the UK. It's a really tough division if you're talking about the elite, right? You've got the Bivols, you've got the Baturbiyevs. I don't think those fights would go very well, to be honest, for Dan Aziz, with all due respect to him. But he's just conquered European. He's saying he wants to step up. I do wonder, how would he do against somebody like Craig Spider Richards? How would he do against an Anthony Yard, against uh, a Joshua Buatzi? You know, the, the sort of guys who are world-class guys, top 10, top 15 sort of guys, maybe Aziz is ready to try and aim for those. Uh, for his next fight. So I'm ready to see it. I really like him. He's a very likable character and really good entertainment as well. Finally, let's discuss Tony Yoka and his defeat at the hands of Carlos Takam. I'm not surprised by this. You know, Tony Yoka, man, he's six foot seven. He's got all the attributes and the tools to be able to pop a guy like Carlos Takam and keep him at range. Carlos Takam's a really good fighter, right? A wily old veteran, a really good war horse, but he's 42 years old. And although he keeps himself in tremendous shape, Ultimately, you're talking about a 42-year-old heavyweight who's a hooker predominantly. He would jump in and he would lead with hooks. So he'd throw a right hook to the body, left hook to the body, right hook to the body, left hook to the body. And they were usually twos. They would come in twos. There was a pattern. And if he gets right up close to you and he's up close, he might lead with an uppercut every now and then or throw a right, right hook to the side of the head. But generally speaking, he was targeting the body more often than not. There was a set pattern there. Now, if he does get close to you, he'll also look for that over-the-top right hand against taller fighters. The point I'm making here is that the majority of the shots are coming from wide positions. When you have six inch reach, uh, a six-inch height advantage, a massive reach advantage, you should be able to be popping a guy of that age, keeping him at range, and moving around the ring when you are an Olympic gold medalist in the amateur system. And yet, for some reason... He likes to shift his weight onto his front foot and lean over, bend over. Why are you doing that? The guy's looking to hook for a start to the body and you're leaning forward. What are you doing? You're bringing your hands to the front of your face so his guard will often come here 
and you're leaning forward, well, you're obviously inviting him to land shots around the elbow. It doesn't make sense to me. There were one or two moments where he was popping a jab and he was going for a walk around the ring. And at those points, you're thinking, yeah, this is what you need to be maintaining. You're never going to keep a guy like Carlos Takam and show some good upper body movement at range consistently. There are going to be moments where you're going to have to exchange or to defend yourself even. He did put on 10 pounds, Tony Yoka, from his last fights. Maybe the thought process was he's a physically tough, rugged man who's going to move me around a little bit. Fine. But then you going to have to say to yourself, this is going to be 20% of the fight. For the majority of the fight, for 80% of every round, I will be maintaining range, popping the jab, and dealing with this guy in that way. And if he does get close enough to try and throw that over the top right hand, I will turn hide behind the shoulder and either come back with a, an uppercut through the pipe or just take a walk and get away. I'm not going to give Carlos Takam what he wants. Instead, he was getting bullied. And post-fight... Martin Bacoli was saying how he felt that he needed to change teams now. And Johnny Nelson corrected him and said, I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's almost as though he hasn't taken responsibility for his own defeat at the hands of Bacoli and hasn't said to himself, I really need to improve on X, Y, and Z. And as a result, he comes in looking lazy. I have to respectfully disagree with Johnny Nelson here because as much as I respect Virgil Hunter and you guys know that I do, a lot of people have been critical of Hunter saying things like the only top fighter he's ever had is Andre Ward. He's not that good of a trainer. I don't think that's the case. I think he's a very good trainer. But it's horses for courses. And the last thing he needs, Tony Yoka, is a calming influence in the corner. And there are two coaches that I think he should potentially consider Tony Yoka if they'd be willing to work with him. One of them would be Buddy McGurk, someone who's going to give him a proper dressing down, tell him to get out there and go and get behind the jam and if you have to fight, fight. But what does Buddy McGurk say? I've never, ever, ever heard Buddy McGurk give corner advice that doesn't include use the jab, get behind the jab. That's the first thing he says. Then he'll add other things. But always, use the jab, get behind the jab. Now, a guy like Buddy McGurk could potentially really help him because he'll give him the fire that he needs, potentially, put his foot up his ass, but also get him using that jab. He was pouring with it, almost like he was afraid to commit. Now, there's surely a psychological element there too. But maybe there's a technical one too, because you keep bending forward. Now, Paulie Malinaji has often said that when he was training with Buddy McGirt, one of the reasons it didn't mesh is because McGirt felt that you should shift your weight onto your front foot and really look to let go of power shots. If that's the case, and it does apply, and he can't adjust to Tony Yoka's attributes, then no, I don't think Tony Yoka should go to Buddy McGirt, because I think he needs to work on distance control. This is a guy that needs to work on using an authoritative jab and moving. If you don't... if Buddy McGirt is not the answer, therefore. You know who could work for Tony Yoka? Peter Fury. Peter Fury will bring up body movement and make, if he's got the biomechanics for it, and make him harder to land on, and he will be able to dictate fights with the jab. Carlos Takam's been talking about a potential fight with Dillian White. There'd be fireworks there. There's no doubt about it. That's one I'd love to see. Let me know what you think about all the other fights we've discussed as well. What did you make of Tim's used performance? Do you think he showed enough to give you belief that he could beat Jamal Charlo? Diego Pacheco, a superstar in the making. Do you think he's a finished article? Or do you think these one or two issues that I've mentioned are still things that he needs to work on before going to the very elite? And finally, Dan Aziz, where does he go from here? And where do you want to see him go now that he's a European champion after another accomplished performance against Thomas Four. Thanks for watching everyone. Please don't forget to hit a stiff jab on the like button, the right cross on the subscribe button, and an uppercut on the notifications button. Thanks for watching. Chat to you soon. Take care. God bless.